Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Greg Hebert and Dennis O'Neill. Greg and Dennis are the co-founders of Leadership Forward, a leadership and executive coaching company. They are the co-authors of a new book coming out next month called Changing Altitude, How to Soar in Your New Leadership Role. This book helps readers become more impactful leaders in a workplace that has been through a significant change over the past few years. So I'm excited to have them on the show to learn from their unique perspective. So Greg and Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a, it's Thanks, fantastic Josh. to be here. Thank you so much. It's great to have you. And I'm excited to hear about this book, but I wanted to get started and talk a little bit about your company, Leadership Forward. What is it that you guys do and what are the type of clients that you serve? Yeah, great question. I'll, I'll take the lead and Denny, jump in as you see fit. Um, a leadership Forward was founded 20 years ago, um, and, and frankly, it came out of uh, a vision that I had developed when I was uh, on the faculty at West Point and had the opportunity to uh, teach experienced officers who were much smarter than me, much more capable, and uh, I realized that in order to help them learn, I had to be a co-learner uh, and uh, let go of my, uh, my, my need and desire to be the expert. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that um, intact leadership teams would benefit from providing just-in-time leadership education uh, that would inve inevitably would be uh, oriented towards, you know, you read this article or you read this book, so what? As you think about your task uh, to drive the operational and strategic effectiveness and success of your organization, you know, based on your collective learning, what are you going to do differently tomorrow, next week, next month? Uh, and, and so one of the first uh, solutions we put on the table was what we called Catalyst, where we, we would show up uh, offsite usually for an intact leadership team. We would give them a Harvard Business Review article, a, a book on some kind of facet of leadership, have them engage that, facilitate a rich, what I would call academic educational session, but in, inevitably point them back to, you know, given your collective learning, your individual learning, what are you going to do differently? And mm -hmm. As part of that collective dynamic, we also uh, suggested to uh, the, the leader who brought us in, you know, provide uh, leadership coaching to each of your leaders at the same time you're going through the collective journey. So there would be this individual engagement as well that usually would start with a leadership assessment 360 to say, you know, what, 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 what are you committed to in, in terms of improving your leadership? And uh, 20 years ago, a lot of our clients were uh, large public companies that uh, we did a lot of healthcare work, a lot of military organizations. And there just seemed to be a real desire to want to improve the quality of the cohesion, alignment, and connection among a, a leader's uh, senior executive team. So, and how has your client base changed over the years? You mentioned big companies in the beginning. Are you still do, working with the big companies or do you see smaller companies in the mix now? Yeah, so we certainly have uh, a pretty good mix, and it, it runs the gamut from, you know, Fortune 500 all the way down to you know rural hospital systems, and and uh, it may be 60,000 employees or or 20 employees. So you know we have have found that uh, that it it is the character of the leader that matters, and, mm -hmm. and much of this book is about self reflection on on character and and personal compass and. Uh, and really acknowledging your personal strengths and and some of your shortcomings that you may want to to learn from and improve on. So it's uh, you know we do spend a, a significant time in in healthcare, but that's you know that's been a gift that's, that just keeps on giving. That <laughs> as uh, one person says, I've got a, a need, and another person says, I, I have a a person. Um, but we also spend quite a bit of time on nonprofit organizations. Uh, and uh, for for profit large co corporations as well. So it's less about the industry and more about helping people learn to to lead better, bigger, faster, and stronger. What would you say if you think back on the last you know three to four years? What are the type of challenges your clients are facing with respect to leadership? Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll take a stab at that. And then you, I know you have a lot of good insights on that as well. Um, you know, it's interesting at the individual level, um, I always see sort of five dominant constellations of problems. The, uh, I got a call yesterday from a large uh, global client that has a, a leader in Norway who um, 
technically brilliant, but overly blunt, overly direct. Uh, you know, there's there's no um, how are you today. It's just like right to business, and and so the client says, can you can you help them develop a little more kindness in how they approach their work with others? Um, client number two says, boy, I've I've got the kindest, most compassionate human being, but can you teach them how to drive results? They need to be more aggressive, create a deeper sense of urgency. The third constellation is. Uh, I have this extraordinary leader who can see the future is so innovative, but <laughs> like the, the, there's fires are all around us. So they need to develop a deeper sense of operational excellence and how to drive today's results for tomorrow. And then, you know, we often get calls to say, you know, uh, this is a brilliant operational leader. Can you help them to think more longer term, more strategically? Yeah, And the fifth leader who, uh, what I'm most proud of perhaps is that these have gotten me fired, is I'll, I'll get a board calling me up saying uh, we've got a, a CEO who, brilliant, they are strategically innovative, but nobody trusts them, uh, they're destructive, uh, they're all about themselves, and, and there's this gap between what they value, what they say they value, and actually what they live, and so can, can you help them develop character? And uh, wow. I do pretty well, and, and, and my colleague does on the first four. Uh, I, I have not, um, I've struggled to help uh, people who are overly narcissistic uh, um, soften uh, some of those qualities. Yeah, yeah, that is a challenge. Yeah, I, I talk about in my books a lot that leadership is a people business. And if you're, if you're all about yourself, you're probably going to struggle a bit with uh, leadership and leading people because it is all about the people side of it. Mm -hmm. So that that's um, so you know what you just mentioned is something that's really interesting. That um, you know we we in business we we want results. We want to grow our businesses. We want to be successful, and we have these leaders. These are people, right? People with all sorts of personalities and quirks and what have you. And you just by the gamut, you just run ran through those five, you know, uh, types of types of leaders. You can see um, that everyone brings something different to the table, but you can see the impact, uh, the adverse impact that those mm -hmm. leadership styles kind of bring to that particular company. So it's really interesting because there've been like fifteen thousand books written on leadership, and we're still struggling to uh, to master this this yeah. uh, this topic because. There are ranges, you know, like you said, whether operational or strategic, whether uh, really good with people, really bad with people. Mm -hmm. And there's, mm -hmm. there's this, and it's a balance really. Yeah. And to be yeah. a successful leader, part of it is balancing all these things and trying to find that sweet spot for your organization. Yeah. But it is a challenge, which keeps people like you employed for 20 <laughs> years, which is a good thing, right? I guess. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. What, um, what in particular have you seen... Um, changing in the past two to three years in the workplace. And these are really, I think, disruptive trends. Mm -hmm. And it, how is that affecting the role of the leader, the role of a traditional manager? What, what do you see happening uh, in the past two to three years? Well, you know, certainly if you look at, if you narrow that down to the past uh, you know, 20 to 24 months, that two year period uh, with, with COVID, you know, and the huge transition to remote workforce, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and looking at the the impact of a global pandemic, um, some of the fundamental principles really haven't changed. You know, if you look at what creates an engaged employee, it's it's a pretty straightforward secret sauce, and and that is, you know, does the individual feel valued for the work that they do? Mm -hmm. Do they feel like the work that they do is meaningful and impactful on the mm -hmm. greater good? Uh, and do they have positive relationships in the workplace? So what's, what's changed over the last two to three years is, you know, who is able to, to, to continue to thrive uh, under those three questions. Uh, and it, it's changed. So if you look at the first, you know, probably six months of the, the pandemic, so you go back a year, year and a half, then uh, the, the third part of that, do I have positive relationships to the workplace, probably wasn't as big of a question. 
Yeah. Right? Because you still knew everybody. You used to sit together and have lunch together. You probably went out on Fridays and, and had a happy hour once in a while. You know, you knew them as individuals. Well, what's then changed over the last year is, you know, with natural uh, transition in a workforce, you, know, you now have colleagues that you've never met in person. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was dealing uh, with uh, a team in, uh, in New Orleans, and you know, there's about a third of uh, the, the recruiting team that has never met the recruiters in North Louisiana because they live in the South, and, and they've never had their all-hands days that they, they would traditionally have. So there has been some unique opportunities for leadership, right? Because those, those fundamental principles of making people believe that they are a fundamental and essential part of the team is still critical. Now, how we go about doing that as leaders has, has changed. And it has probably become even more important than ever before because it doesn't just occur naturally. It has to be something that is intentional and, and worked at. And I, I know Greg has had some examples of this just in the recent past. Yeah, the, the, the other thing, John, is um, I, I spent a lot of time uh, t teaching and educating um, a, a lot of the audiences on this theme called post-traumatic growth. And, and the essence of it is that for every 100 people that go through some incredible traumatic experience, 9-11, the, the Battle of Britain, being a POW in Vietnam, losing a loved one, um, you know, having everything you have wiped away by a flood or a hurricane or a fire, that for every hundred people that go through that, we, we, we know conclusively that 12 to 15 to 20 of them will get post-traumatic stress um, and, 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 and experience that in a prolonged way. But we also know now more about the 25 to 35 that will emerge from these traumatic experiences more clear of their purpose, mm -hmm. more compassionate and empathetic in their relationships, stronger in their sense of resilience, not uh, worrying about the small stuff and paying attention to what really matters and a certainly a deepened and strengthened belief in spiritual system. So, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I think you're seeing is some people coming out of this very difficult time, stronger, more clear, and, and it, in many ways, it's, it's uh, strengthening the work that Denny and I do because we're able to, to, to tell, tell senior clients, you've got to create the most positive work engagement possible because your best talent now you know, faced with this you know, existential challenges to what's important in life, they have a lot more opportunity. And if they don't believe there's a values fit between your organization and them, they're going to leave. And, yeah. and so the message that Denny and I get to say to leaders, if you're not actively engaging in uh, you know, making sure your people feel valued, seen, heard, welcomed, embraced, you're going to lose your very best. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's some good of all of this disruption and what I would call civic and environmental and uh, political unrest that, that says, uh, you know, we need to create more high-performing, engaged, and connected teams uh, more than ever. And, and as Denny said, it's, it's incredibly challenging when you're doing it through Zoom and not face-to-face -face yeah. and eye-to-eye. -eye. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing I think too is that you know over the past eighteen months, people have had a little more freedom. You know, they're they're working from home, mm -hmm. so you know they might sleep in a little bit. They might get a workout during during lunch, or you know they might have they they they've, they've had a more of a they've had more control over their day compared to being in the office, right? Yeah. And yeah. so now we're asking them. Soon we'll be asking them to come back to the office, and and so are we going to? Uh, and they've had this taste of freedom. You know what it's like to. To, to kind of live your own life without, you know, somebody watching over your shoulders. Now, how are we going to treat them when they come back to the workforce? Are we going to be, all right, now you got to be in at eight o'clock. I want clean desks. I want everybody, nobody's late to meetings. You know, how are we, how will we treat them after we gave them, you know, essentially two years of freedom? That'll be an interesting, um, and if we, if we don't acknowledge that, I think you're going to lose a lot of people when they say, you know what, maybe I'll start my own business. Maybe I'll do consulting. Maybe I'll do something different. Yeah. Why, why should I be here? But it's interesting. I, I, I had a leadership session tonight with a, 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 a several leaders, physician and administrative of a cath lab, people who do these very, very specialized uh, cardiac services to help save people's lives in terms of putting stents and balloons in patients. And uh, I've been working with them a while. And 
one of the doctors was praising the administrative leader because they're losing one of their best nurses and they're losing the nurse because she's got two small children and she can't take a call anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the doctor was praising the administrative leader because the administrative leader said, look, it, we love you. We want you to stay. You're extraordinary. But if I create an exception for you not to take call, I'm going to have 10 other nurses lined up behind you to ask for the same thing. And we can't provide the kind of care to our patients if we don't have people ready to respond at any hour of the day and night to the need. So, um, you know, that was an interesting conversation. And what was really uh, impressive was the physicians who love this nurse acknowledging that if you give her special treatment, you know, it's going to create all of this disorder and chaos behind her. And, you know, this, like, uh, what a terrible time to lose a great nurse mm -hmm. when uh, you look across uh, America, uh, at just about every healthcare institution is struggling uh, with, with having enough nurses. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let's, let's switch gears a little bit about the, we got a new book coming out um, it's called Changing uh, Altitude. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the book. Why did you write it? You know, who, who's the audience for this book mm. and, um, what do you hope the impact will be for those that read it? So the audience is, is really anybody in a leadership role who's now changing into a different, uh, role. So, you know, I used to, uh, teach, uh, a course as a, a full professor. I, I taught a strategic leadership course. And you know, I, I would fundamentally spend a year helping people transition from you know, answering somebody else's question right to making sure that the right question got asked. Uh, and that was a fundamentally different skill set. And the, the, the premise was then that leadership at different levels isn't just doing more of the same. It, okay. it requires a fundamentally different skill set. And we, we have to be able to identify not only what that skill set is, but how does that fit into our own personal strengths and, and opportunities? And then be honest uh, about the opportunities and then seek self-development. So, you know, we, we got into this because one of our clients, um, a, a corporate client outside of Chicago, uh, was, was being promoted from running a 250-person organization to almost 2,500. And overnight went from one business unit to to uh, six business units. And so you would go from uh, basically being a, a master of your own domain to now operating in a world where you are no longer the subject matter expert in everything that happened. Yes. And he asked us, you know, what, what is out there? What articles, what books, what can I read? How can I best prepare for this, you know, massive transition uh, for him? And that's was Greg and I spent a lot of time researching it. And, you know, we found a tremendous amount written about our first leadership experience and a tremendous amount written about our culminating role as a CEO. But making that transition in between, uh, there was just very little that existed to help people in a very practical way to say, you know, what do I need to think about in terms of you know, inspiring engagement and advocating excellence and implementing and planning and driving results and, and developing uh, leading change in, in understanding the impact of culture and practicing those, those teamwork and collaboration skills that we've discussed a little bit. It, there just was very little uh, to say, here's a roadmap of what I need to focus on, pay attention to, and to learn from, uh, as, as well as you know, some ways to self-reflect on my own personal uh, level of, of, of integrity and, and humility. So, you know, we looked at, uh, at the individual person, we looked at those that were leading, we looked at the environment around and tried to put that into a narrative under this, this onus of changing altitude. And that is, you know, how do we rise above the clouds sometimes? To, uh, as in an airline, airline, or in your ways, maybe it's going down in the submarine. <laughs> But right. you know, how, how do we change that altitude to the right position where we can see what we need to at the time? And yeah. sometimes that involves going up. Sometimes that involves coming down. Yeah. But it is, you know, what are all those instruments on the panel that we need to be able to see in order to understand the environment that we're operating in and to be able to 
lay on our backs and look up when we need to, and to look down uh, from a, a top balcony when that is required as well. Well, that's just great. To, to, yeah. to build on that, Denny, the, I think the other thing that, why we really, um, that, that title of changing altitude really resonates with us is if you look through the great errors of, of uh, leaders in positions of, of immense power and authority, invariably um, they, they made decisions based on what they thought they knew and what they thought was right. And when you unpack it, there were dimensions of the complexity of the situation that were never fully appreciated. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, 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 you know, we, we think that humility is often underrated and, and that hubris uh, too often takes uh, time. We, we, we cite these two researchers from uh, University of North Carolina, uh, Dunning and Kruger, who came up with the Dunning-Kruger mm -hmm. effect yeah. that said uh, um, human beings, especially males, think they know far more than they really do. Yes. And you know, it was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld who ironically said these words, it's not what you know or don't know that's going to get you in trouble, it's what you don't know you don't know. Right. So we, we think we, we do a, a, a pretty thorough job to sort of give some tools to the reader, you know, that before you proclaim, I know, <laughs> there, there's a process to go through to make sure that you know for sure. Yeah. No, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. I know, you know, when I was a young leader, you know, my first factory, I got at 32 years old. And, and I was intimidated because I thought I needed to know all the answers, right? I, I had to I had to know everything because I was the leader. I was the guy in the corner of us. I had to have all the answers. And what I learned and what I've been learning for 30 years is that it's not so much having all the answers, but having the right questions and yeah. having the ability to shut your mouth and listen to the people that have been there and have done that and have the experience and have the battle scars and to listen to those stories and then put all those stories together to come up with the direction that, that you're going to head. So have the ability to be humble enough to say, yeah. all right, I don't know, but you do. Tell yeah. me, tell me yeah. what you think, you know, and getting that input is really, really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing you say uh, that is, this is a new era of leadership and you say that it's more important uh, it's it's less important to see what employees are actually doing, but more important to understand how they feel. Oh, what man. do you mean by that in this yeah, new so, era that we're in? Yeah, I'm really proud to, to tell this story. Um, on Friday, I was helping a, a leadership team that's gone through in healthcare. They went through four. The first surge uh, for this organization was horrendous. And the fourth surge almost uh, matched it in terms of uh, ferocity and, and the number of COVID patients and all their ICU beds taken. And this particular leader was talking about her experiences as a director of the emergency department at their largest uh, uh, hospital. And uh, she has gone through hell. She, she remembers the very first patient that she encountered in, in early March of 2020. And we didn't know anything about um, uh, you know, protective equipment. And so she responded instinctively to this patient collapsing in front of her and she took care of that patient. And well, lo and behold, a week later she had COVID and lo and behold, you know, a week and a half later her kids did. And mm. so she was just telling about the 20 months of her experience. And, but she said like uh, not too long ago, she got a call from the CEO and that CEO oversees 35,000 employees. Wow. And he had heard about her uh, sacrificial leadership and, uh, just reached out to say, hey, I'm checking in on you and I want to see how you're doing. And she admits that oftentimes when people ask how she's doing, she always responds like, oh, I'm doing great. You know, life is couldn't yeah, be better. Yeah, yeah. And so she pulled that answer because it's the CEO. And, and he paused and he said, no, how are you really doing? Mm, yeah. And just the way he said it and the care in, in, his, in his voice, said, it's, it's okay for me to tell him that right, it, this is hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's been a challenge. And I, I love to tell that story because, I, you know, uh, how do we create more CEOs like that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm going to, yeah, and I'm going to tell as many people who will listen to me about that story because he's an amazing example of 
you know, despite, you know, being 10 levels above this woman, he has the courage and the insight to reach out and check in with how she's doing. And yeah, I mean, I, just show, it shows the ability to care that you care, right? And I think that's a major, it's a major signal because not only does she see that this CEO cares, that story gets out through the rest of the organization that this CEO cares. And I was just going to mention, I had my uh, my first seat and my first captain of my submarine. Uh, he he had me get the ship ready for for sea, and I'd never done it before. Mm. And he was an 06, and I was probably an 02 at the time. <laughs> and, um, he was off. He wasn't even on board the submarine, and we had a dependence <laughs> cruise. We had 70 yeah. VIPs showing up, and I had to prepare the submarine for sea oh and take God. it to sea. And it was something I'd never done before. Yeah. When he finally showed up, he came to the bridge, and the first question he asked me is, how do you feel? Yeah. And I was really surprised by that question. Yeah. But yeah. he cared more about me as a person and less about the status of the yeah. submarine at the time. And, and that's, I think, Mark's a great leader is that yeah. they're willing to say, you know, how are you feeling right now? Or what, what's it, what's, you know, what's really going on with you? It shows, it shows they care. And it's something that I'll never forget that. And that was, you know, 30 years ago. And I said, oh, that's that. a great, oh. that's a great story. Love that. Yeah, it really is. As you, you think about how do leaders inspire engagement? Mm. That's really what you're getting at the heart of is, you know, somebody that's respected, somebody that's approachable, uh, helps you be aware uh, of yourself and, and learn, and that you show the, the employees, or in your case, the sailor, that you value them and mm. that you're empowering them. Uh, and, and I love the, the term of, of fostering a notion of psychological safety, where mm. they not only are they approachable, but at, just as in the example that Greg had when the, the CEO said, no, how are you really doing? Yeah, but providing yeah. that safe space for somebody to have an open and honest conversation, not only so the CEO can, can gain a greater understanding, but the employee can feel uh, valued and, uh, and rewarded for their, for their personal sacrifice that they have made. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think even going back to what I was saying earlier too, there's, there's, there's 35,000 employees, right? You can't obviously have that kind of interaction with 35,000 employees, but you have one yeah. with one. And then the word gets out as to, to, to who you are and what your character is. So I always believe that in leadership, sometimes we just set an example or we, and, and, and you know, I mean, on you were in the military as well. So, you know, the, the rumor, the rumor mill goes faster well, than yeah. any sort of yeah. corporate communication you can yeah. ever have. Right. So, um, you know, so you allow the word to get out that this actually happened. And I think those, uh, it helps you, you know, why you can't reach out to 35,000 people. Yeah, they, you can reach out with enough people where the people see that this is your character. This is who you and are. And, uh, you know, certainly Tom Brady did not need more notoriety as, as the, you know, the greatest of all. But what he did uh, on, on Sunday, the little boy who had a sign that said, you, you, you help me heal from brain cancer. Yeah. And, and, and Brady having the wherewithal to go up and make that a memorable moment for the, the, the son, the father, the, I mean, who, who, who was not positively moved by that? Yeah. And did Brady need to do that? No, absolutely not. And, you know, we cared less about the fact that he, you know, hit 600 touchdowns. We, we cared about, wow, his humanity, his yeah. humanity. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And you actually saw, talk about that. You say that leaders need to have a balance of uh, empathy, self-reflection, and self-development, those three subjects. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a little bit about those three and why those are so important. We, we kind of mentioned empathy a little bit. Yeah, I'll start, uh, Denny, and sure, please ahead. feel free to jump in. I, I, um, you know, when you, when you look at the foundations of leadership, uh, emotional intelligence comes up over and over again. And, and so you talked about feeling and we, we, we've, we've you know, took feelings out of you should never have those and leave them at the door to they're an important part of not just being human, but um, actually we know now that without emotional reasoning, we make terrible decisions or we, we can't make decisions at all. So it's, a, it, it's something that needs to be nurtured. And if you dig deep into the literature of leadership going back to the Sumerians 10,000 years ago in the Code of Hammurabi, you'll find the language of know thyself. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, uh, being a, a, an army officer, I have tremendous respect for my Marine colleagues. And if you look at the Marine Corps, 10 principles of effective leadership in the armies, they're identical. Uh, soldier is exchanged for Marine and vice versa. 
Yep. But but always the first principle is know thyself. Yeah. Right. And so uh, equipping a leader to begin with, you know, as you look in the mirror, what do you see? And having the courage uh, and empathy to say you can't be perfect. I uh, one of the strengths I have in all, all of my personality assessments, but those who work closest with me, and Denny's one of them is. I am one of the most spontaneous, flexible human beings you'll ever meet in your life. That you know, I, I will change my approach to a human being based on signs and things that are not even spoken. Mm. But, but I am not very good to, to be organized and to be structured and to, to uh, be deliberate. And, and so the army was very good to me in providing those things that I don't <laughs> naturally do, right? And so you know, empathy for yourself to recognize you have gifts, you have strengths, but you have some liabilities and you can't let the liabilities become the reason why you can't be successful. So you got to manage those, but you're really going to soar when you know what your strengths are and you focus and hone and refine and cultivate them because that's where you're going to really flourish. So uh, you know, I think knowing thyself and, and having the courage to take the journey, you know, one, one of the things that I, I'm very clear with clients when they say, you know, can you coach him or her or can you coach me? is my first question is, is, you know, are, are you, are, are you content with who you are today? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you take the Popeye defense, I am who I am. And if you don't like it yeah. tough, yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm probably not going to be the best one to coach you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I, I think there's a dilemma out there and you guys are in it in longer than me, but you know, just as a practitioner of leadership, I see that the, the best leaders are constantly trying to learn and trying to develop and trying to get better. They're the ones reading the leadership books and they're le reading the autobiographies and the, they're trying to get better at their craft. It seems like the, 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 the bad bosses out there aren't, aren't self-reflecting and aren't self-developing, but yet we write the books in the hopes that they might pick it up and read it. So the question is always- but The like, wrong people are reading it. <laughs> how do you get the books in the hands of the people that actually need it? That's yeah. something I've struggled with and trying to figure out the best way to do that. But because it seems like the people that really need to, to, to read these books and to learn are the ones that are like, le less likely to pick it up because they, they know all the answers. They, you know, they, they know what, like you said, they, they're 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 comfortable in in who they are and they don't want to change and that's not a good place to be as a leader. Well, as as Denny said, this book is is targeted to um, you know certainly leaders who have changed their scope and responsibilities in extraordinary ways. But I'm also incredibly hopeful that uh, that as this book comes out, uh, as a leader promotes his or her uh, so, someone into a leadership role, they'll think about this book because my. My hope and desire, John, is that we can get to younger, younger leaders and, and, and give them a, a thirst and a fire for self-development that it's, it's a continuous journey. And, uh, you know, I, I will tell you, I had this delightful coaching call with a young nurse leader. He's not young, though. He's, he's in his uh, late 30s. And, and, and for him to say, you know, Greg, you're, you know, I think I've developed a greater capacity to be aware of my emotions and and my, you know, and he admitted to have a temper. He says, but you know, where where I think I can really use this is at home uh, with my daughter and my girlfriend. Uh, yeah. do, do, do you think these things can be applied there? And <laughs> I'm, I'm saying to myself, 100%. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's the same thing. You're leading your family, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point about self-assessment, self-reflection. You know, what does it mean to be a, a consummate leader? And that means we seek self-improvement. And, and you're right, not everybody does that. Uh, you know, I, I've, you know, given hundreds, thousands of 360s that, that Greg and I have given to different clients. And it's always interesting, you know, the ones that need the highest level of self-awareness are the ones that probably want it the least. <laughs> so there, there is a challenge there. Well, good. I'm not the only one who's tried to figure out this dilemma and how to crack the code, but it's definitely a but challenge. But there is that, that opportunity to lead up, yep. to lead down, and, and to lead laterally. So, you know, leadership isn't just about hierarchy by any means. There's a, right. a, a great number of leaders in any organization that don't have any, you know, official title, yet, you know, they help provide the purpose, direction, and motivation of the organization towards a, a common goal. And, uh, and the ability to, to improve your own personal reflection, therefore to help others, e yep. even if they might be you know, a higher hired salary individual than you is, is absolutely true. I, 
Greg uses uh, the story of Lincoln uh, and some of the, uh, the, the opportunities that he had when he was working with uh, a gentleman named Stanton who was very antagonistic against him. And, and um, it, it would have been very natural for Lincoln to keep this guy at arm's length for the rest of the time, but he actually embraced him. And, and the, the book, The Team of Rivals really, you know, gets into this notion of Lincoln surrounding himself with people that did not think like him and, and oftentimes felt they were superior to him you know, because they, you know, Lincoln had enough level of humility and enough level of, of self-respect that even if people challenged him, he was open and willing to those thoughts and ideas. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, this this book is going to be great. And, and, you know, leaders out there, I really encourage you to look this up. Um, it's called Changing Altitude. So it comes out in November. Is that right? November Absolutely. 9th. November 9th. So we uh, we chose uh, Veterans Day weekend, as all three of us on this podcast are veterans. And and uh, Veterans Day, obviously, on the, uh, the 11th, which is a Thursday this this year. So uh, our publicist said, you uh, you have to publish a book on a Tuesday. So Tuesday, Tuesday November 9th, it is. But intentionally targeted uh, for those that have ever served in uniform, uh, certainly, and it's not a, a military leadership book. It's, it's written by two people that have experience in the military, but also a lot of experience in, in, in government, in academia, uh, and in the, the, the private sector as well. So we hope you'll go to uh, 3eleadershipgroup.com and, uh, and take a look at it, or straight towards changingaltitude.co. And uh, we, we look forward to, to getting this book into your hands and, and think it's one of those books that uh, leaders are going to pass to anybody that they promote in their organization. Uh, that's fantastic. I encourage all leaders, this comes out uh, in November here, and I encourage you guys to, to take a look, go get this book, and um, we'll put the links in the show notes. But the book is called Changing Altitude, How to Soar in Your New Leadership Role. Greg and Dennis, I really appreciate you coming yeah. on the show and sharing all of your insight. And I think this is going to be a really important book. So I appreciate you coming on the show, but also writing this book and getting it out to the world, because I think this is the kind of book that we need more of. So I'm really encouraged by what I've heard, and I'm excited to go out there and get it myself here in a couple of weeks. Thanks, John. Thank what a, so what a gift and a pleasure to be here, truly. Well, the pleasure was mine. I appreciate you guys coming on the show. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.